It's been really fun to see Anne put herself in a position where her passion to alleviate suffering would make its way into plans and leadership and interviews and stuff like that. I um, appreciate Anne's heart. I've heard it said that when those news clips come on, she'd been able to be interviewed a number of times. She runs out of the room. <laughs> and she doesn't want to see herself on TV, and so it's not all about that for her. What it's about is an opportunity to express her faith through love, really cared about some of the things she saw, said, you know, I really care about this. What can we do? And she was willing to put herself, just as a facilitator, it's neat to see how things have evolved. We are in the middle of a series where we're asking some questions. Uh, why? Questions are okay. In fact, a disciple in the time of Jesus was one who sat at the foot of a rabbi and asked why, asked questions. So it's not bad to ask questions. It's what we're supposed to do when we don't understand something, not in the spirit of, you better tell me or I won't fall, but in the spirit of, I want to know, and you're the one with the answers. And we've been trying to come to not do the best we can. Why evil? Uh, why sexual immorality? Uh, next weekend, why sickness? Um, we'll talk about, today we'll talk about why war. The historian, uh, one historian, Will Durant, estimated that in all history, there have been only 29 years in which there wasn't a war somewhere. In all of history, all of recorded history, estimated that there have been only 29 years in which there was no war underway somewhere in the world. Which goes to say that we are a warlike people. There is war between us. It seems like there always has been. The 20th century has been an interesting one. It says, at the heart of the 20th century is the black fact that it was the most murderous century in history. So looking further from a global perspective over the course of span of recorded history, the 20th century was the bloodiest, most murderous century in recorded history. And in terms of the bookends that lie on either side of that, in uh, at about World War I, there was the Ottoman massacre of about a million and a half Armenians. That's on the front side of this century. On the, the back side of this century, there were the uh, massacres in Rwanda and Sudan in the 1990s, in which about three million people died. And those are, as a book I'll be talking about, Unspeakable by Oz Guinness. Uh, there are some writers. He is kind of a writer in the, in the spirit of C.S. Lewis. He's... He comes at things from trying to think of things from a Christian perspective, very well read, very quotes things at length, is an interesting guy, has wrote some very interesting books. And so in the interest, if you're a reader, Oz Guinness, and he writes a book unspeakable in which he tries to figure out how can we respond to the whole question of evil, war, and all the things that exist. He he indicated in his book that... uh, It is sometimes argued that the modern world is more humane than ever before, and in some ways, it is. The paradox, however, he goes on to say, is that we save more victims than ever before and slaughter more victims than ever before. And that's the paradox of it. We save more victims than ever and yet slaughter more victims than ever before. The Rwandan bloodbath, he goes on to talk about, for example, was one of the fastest massacres in history. In less than three months, machete-wielding Hutus ferociously slaughtered more than 800,000 Tutsis, the clearest case of genocide since the Holocaust, Holocaust, carried out at three times the speed of Hitler's extermination of Jews and gypsies. Over the course of the last century, we've said never again, as dignitaries stood by Auschwitz, but it seems like the never again became an again. Um, statistics are stunning in the face of the fact that there was a lot of talk about where we're progressing as people. In the 19th century, Uh, The Enlightenment came and people were feeling really positive, really up about uh, the human person. 
and the character of humanity, where we were making rapid strides in industry and being able to feed people and aspirin and uh, anesthesia were created in the latter part of the 18th century, in the like 1880s, 1890s. And it was felt at that time that we're ushering in a century where finally, with anesthesia, aspirin, other medications, it would be possible by and large to minimize the amount of pain that people have to experience. And that's medically what happened, and yet, in the 20th century, wars killed more than 100 million people. In the 20th century, wars killed 100 million people, and genocides, the exterminate, the attempt to exterminate a people took more than 100 million lives in the 20th century, making it, again, one of the blackest, most murderous centuries in history. In the movie The Diary of Anne Frank, the last scene shows her in a fog enshrouded image in a concentration camp, swaying in that. And um, what she says in the movie is this, in spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart. Now, Anne Frank did write that in her diary, but she didn't write that at the end of her diary, more towards the front. She didn't write... I st- what she wrote is this, I simply can't build up my hopes on a foundation consisting of confusion, misery, and death. And it was felt like if her character said that, that would be too... That would be too much of a down at the end of a movie like that. It's not a real comforting movie. But she was very confused at the evil that she saw. We have had a taste of that. 9-11, we tasted it firsthand, saw the images. Perhaps haven't tasted as much. We definitely haven't, not perhaps. As much as they experienced in Rwanda and as much as they experienced in Sudan, in different places, in Auschwitz. Um, In 1943, when um, World War II was underway, Japan, the Japanese government, took some foreigners who were living in different places in China and sent them to an internment camp. And it was a place where they would not be tortured. They would be provided with the basic necessities. It would only be a compound about 150 by 200 yards in Weixian, in the Shandong uh, province. I had a chance to visit there when I was in China. Got to go around and, and see some of the places around Shandong, and they went to this internment camp. There were about, I think, 500 or so from Beijing, and Langdon Gilkey was one of them. He wrote a book about his experience, The Shantung Compound, by Langdon Gilkey. And what ended up happening is this. They were Westerners from about 20 different nations, And again, the Japanese government said, we want to provide for a safe environment for you, so we're going to march you to uh, the buses, and then we're going to take you to the Shandong province, province to the Weixian camp, and you will be allowed to spend the war there. What ended up happening, they took the 500 Westerners and paraded them through the streets of Beijing, and they had a lot of Chinese lining up the sides, and it was a clear signal they, had to, they were loaded down with things. There go the Westerners. And, and the end of Western influence in the Orient. And it was pretty much true. Since then, a lot of things have changed in the Orient. Anyway, they got to this internment camp. And they had... It was the thing that made it interesting and the thing the book's based on is they had the best and the brightest. They had engineers and electricians. They had all different kinds of people representing a lot of different kinds of skills. Now, there, weren't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of space, but they had peace. They had resources, both human and material. And they just had to deal with being in such close proximity. And they actually did pretty well. In fact, once they got there, the people from Beijing were joined by individuals from Tianjin, the city that I was at, and Qingdao, another city uh, in the, uh, the eastern part of the country. They were joined by Eric Little, 
who was the runner in Chariots of Fire. If you remember, when he competed in the Olympics, the one he wouldn't run on Sunday, ended up running, ended up winning that Olympic uh, 400 meters. He ended up uh, going to China as a missionary. He went to Tianjin, with the city that I was in. In fact, you can go to Tianjin, and you can see the place where he was boarded, where he operated out of. He was one of the ones, again, being a Westerner, he was sent to the same compound. And that's where he spent, I think, four years. I'm not sure how many. But that's where he died. He had a heart attack. And he died, I think, just days before the, um, the Allies came in and, and, and he was released. At any rate, what ended up happening, they did pretty well at this compound. It started off, they had to organize everything, and they had, the place was a mess. It was like a, it was a missionary compound, but they had, well, they had to learn a couple things. They had had forced labor to do all their labor, so they had to roll up their sleeves, and they had to deal with plugged up toilets and stuff like that, and they took care of that stuff. They had to figure out how we're going to distribute food. They were able to take care of that stuff too. How do we organize and govern ourselves? And, and it was kind of like a little experiment. You know, what happens if you put together well-educated people, moral people, and put them in a situation where they have to get along? What happens? It started off good. Here's when things started to go south. They would, every day, they would get on donkey-pulled carts, they would get provisions to feed themselves, etc., etc., etc. This one day, they got donkey cart after donkey cart after donkey cart of piled up parcels. And they, there was 1,500 of them. Said Red Cross on them. And the Japanese authorities, who made sure nobody got out of the internment camp, but they didn't interfere in what happened on the inside of the camp. What he ended up doing is, is making a decision. Um, we're going to give one parcel to each, and if you are an American, you get another half parcel, since this comes from the American Red Cross. Langdon Gilkey, one of the Americans, one of 200 Americans, would say later, he goes, that's a brilliant stroke. What ended up happening, though, is seven of the Americans went and protested to the Japanese commandant, the person in charge of the camp, said, this is stuff from America, and you don't have the right to give this to non-Americans. What ended up happening, when they came out that next morning, this was like Christmas, when they came out the next morning, they were going to distribute these things, they were told that the Americans protested and that they would have to wait to give these things out when they decided what they were going to do. Can you imagine what happened after that? Everything had been going pretty well up until that point, but when there was an influx of wealth, and it was unequally distributed at that point, the lack of division before became division. Then you started to notice American, English, black and white, guilty would say this, I suddenly saw, as never so clearly before, the really dynamic factors in social conflict. Why do things break down? Why is there war? He goes on and says, how wealth compounded with greed and injustice leads inevitably to strife, and how such strife can threaten to kill the social organism. What he said was this, here's basically what happened. They were able to govern themselves, do all this stuff, but the thing that they couldn't couldn't keep under the surface was the desire to have more. To not want to give. That's what Marxism claimed to do. Marxism didn't do that. It claimed to, but that's the thing in the human condition that makes it so difficult. And it's not just them, it's us. It's us. We want more. We want to protect what we have. We want to get what we want and to keep what we have. It's part of what we deal with as people. In the cover of the book, The Shantung Compound, it has a quote from the Three Penny Opera I really like. For even saintly, saintly folks will act like sinners unless they have their customary dinners. <clears throat> a war like people, <clears throat> there's war between us, ultimately because there's war within us. Look what it says. 
in the sheet, there's some verses written out. A verse we land on a lot, for some reason, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. And what it seems to say, then, is the reason why there's this kind of conflict is because there's this kind of conflict. I see something that I want. Maybe you have it. And I might try subtly to get what I want. If I can't get what I want, and I really want it, I won't let myself rest. And now I'll have to start to act in such a way as to get what I want. Why? Because I can't live with the fact that I want it and don't have it. And ultimately what James is saying, think about it. Why don't you think about it? What causes fights and quarrels? The, our, our initial reaction is, well, he's bossy. She's a loudmouth. He's always bragging. She does this and it drives me nuts. And what James says, again, he goes, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Doesn't it come from your desires that battle within you? Again, we've said this before, that's, that's not a question that's a question. You know, again, it's like, it's like a question parents ask their kids. Didn't I tell you not to touch that? That's not a question. No, you know what, I'm, I'm trying to think if you did tell me to touch that or not. You know, that's not the kind of response if you're a kid. You don't want to say that. Didn't I tell you never to say, oh, I, you know, I'm trying to think of that. And you, you, because it's not a question. And that's what James is saying. It's from your desires that battle within you. That's the deal. You want something. When you can't get it, you can't live with the fact. We can't live with the fact that we don't have it. And what ends up happening, this explodes out this way. That's what James says. I like the way Mark Lauritsen puts it in a Lauritsism. We have a number of Lauritsen isms. Self will run riot. Self will run riot. Why war? I think that's as good as anything. War within us inevitably leads to war between us. At the Shantung compound, uh, this is what ended up happening. What they found? In order for people to be able to coexist, they've got to be a commitment to some kind of morality. Because ultimately, it will get to the place where somebody has what others don't have, and what they experience, that's when the compound really had difficulty. And initially, in that place, Eric Little would have been one of them who would have been irrelevant in the beginning. And Eric Little was a missionary. He went to that compound, and in the first part, he would have been a novelty. In fact, he, at this compound, he um, made some athletic teams and did athletic events. He coached students. He taught and did stuff like that. They had Sunday worship services, which would have been irrelevant in the beginning. What ended up happening, though, what they found out was if you live in a three-by-six-foot little section, that's all the space you get, you have to keep all your belongings within three to six feet. I saw that. You're crowding into my space. That's what ended up happening. And it became fights over. You took more. You did. And that's the thing that broke it down. What they found how do you create in people a willingness to be forgiving, selfless? Maybe there does need to be some kind of moral engine. And towards, as this compound continued to exist, people like Eric Little, maybe we do need to hear what you have to say. Because just governing ourselves, distributing everything, doesn't work if people don't have a heart to share. That's what they ended up finding. We are warlike people, <clears throat> a God of war. If you read to the Old Testament of the Bible, there are atrocities that make your hair stand up. Entire civilizations of people getting wiped out. God's saying, wipe out every man, woman, and child. Some very difficult things to read through. Why when we go to the Old Testament, some of us go and say, what? I don't get this. In one place, there was a 186,000 man army 
outside the, the walls of Jerusalem, threatening them. And the king prays, God, these people are threatening us. And God says, because you prayed to me, they're not going to enter this city. But they're right outside the building. They're not going to enter the city. The next morning, they woke up. Somebody went outside the city gates, and everyone was dead. There were 186,000 bodies lying dead. They think it probably was a plague. That's what the Assyrian records seem to indicate. They don't talk a lot about it. And when you're reading through it, when you're reading through the story, it's like a, yeah! You know, they were, th- they were the black hats, but you know what the deal was? There were some people in the army that were just, they were good people. 186 thousand. And you know what the difficulty with stuff like that is? Stalin said this. The death of one is a tragedy. The death of a million is a statistic. We can't even get our arms around that. I wonder if you laid body to body 186,000, five or six feet per, how far would that go? Five feet, 186, I don't know, ten miles? Be a long way. And when you look at stuff like that, well, look at what this passage says, too. In Daniel, it's predicted, the end will come like a flood. War will continue to the end. Desolations have been decreed. And it's predicting here, war will continue. Desolations have been decreed. By who? Apparently by God. Um, In the book of Daniel, it shows... And again, why I raise these things, there are some questions that are troubling. Easy answers, there are some answers. I don't think they're easy. Why are we raising them? Because they're there. Some of us, you've thought these things. See, it doesn't hurt to ask questions, even if they're difficult ones. We don't need to be afraid of this. Ultimately, we'll see why everything is as it is, but we don't need to be afraid to notice things and say it out loud. God, I don't get it. Now, I'm not smart, I might not ever get it, but it's okay to ask that question. When, in the book of Daniel, it talks about, well, here's what's going to happen. The, the kingdom of Babylonia will be overtaken by the kingdom of Persia, will be overtaken by the kingdom of Greece, will be taken over by the kingdom of Rome. And it, it, this was way before any of this ever happened. And it was exactly right. And all the people that died in that thing. Um, can't answer all the questions. What I want to do, just a couple of images for you to kind of to consider as you're dealing with this stuff um, that God is a God of peace. When God's rule is established, well, look what it says. It describes in Isaiah a time in the midst of all the conflict that's happening when God would come and his rule would be established. And this is what, this is what he says about what happens when God's will is being done. And when you hear this, well, let me read it first. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Why? I think because God, when his rule is established, is a God of peace. Some of you would be, might say then, well, at time, Mike, I thought that God was in charge. Isn't he the all-powerful ruler? Yeah, he is. But in this world, there are kingdoms in conflict and wills at war. You say, what do you mean? It says, we're supposed to pray, part of the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy... You know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy name. Thy kingdom come... Would you say? Say it again. Why would you ask for God's will to be done? Isn't it already done? Why would Jesus ask you to pray, Thy will be done? Deliver us from the evil one. That's what comes next. That's what comes down the line, right? Hmm. What the Bible would indicate is that this world is under the influence of the evil one. That means there's kingdoms in conflict and wills at war. God's will is not for warfare. Ultimately, when he calls the shots, 
That sword, turn that into a spade. You know, that spear, turn that into a pruning hook. You know, when you're trying to get figs off the leaves and stuff like that, you have to reach up high. Turn that thing into a gardening implement because, you know, you're not going to need to stick anybody. Why don't I need to stick anybody? Because I'm in charge, God would say. So, well, why not? But there are kingdoms in conflict and wills at war for the time being. Um, the absence of God is associated with the presence of destruction. Look what, when Jesus was going to Jerusalem, again, one of the good things about having the Bible is because Jesus represents what God is like. How does God feel about when people are overthrown and suffer? I wonder how God feels about that. Well, we just need to look at Jesus. Look, read this. With it, it, it tells about an instance when Jesus is going to Jerusalem. It's on Palm Sunday, as a matter of fact. He's outside the city, and in the hills coming into Jerusalem, he looks, and he's going to go, and he knows that in, within a week he'll be dead. And he envisions what's going to happen in the future. Look, look what it says. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he is Jesus, he wept over it. This is one of two times we know that Jesus cried. And when Jesus cried, I don't think, you know, they're very demonstrative. I don't think he turned away and, you know, and just, I, I, when Jesus cried, I think, I just think he wailed. I, I, I think his heart was rent. Look, why? Look what it goes on to say. And he talks to the city. He looks, and he looks over it, and says, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you. They will not leave one stone on another because you didn't recognize the time of God coming to you. He looks, and what he envisions is the siege of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., and one stone wasn't left on another. It was terrible what happened during that siege. They crucified bunches of people outside the city gates. On the, on the way into Jerusalem, there were crosses with people crucified on the entrance there. Children dashed. It, it was awful. And they say Josephus, the historian, ends up... Re- recording, and I'm going to spare you details, they even had to turn to cannibalism because the siege was so long and, and the suffering was so great. And I think Jesus, and I don't understand how he knows all this stuff, but he looks and sees into the future. And his, his reaction is not, you asked for it. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. As he's not a hawk. It's, ah, do something, Jesus. Don't just cry, do something. And what Jesus would say, I am. I am going to do something. And that's what we'll have to get to. What did he do? But here, what I want you to see, he saw the future destruction of Jerusalem, and it just, it welled up within him as a grief. The kind of grief that I think a parent would experience if they come to the place where their child is hit by a car because they wouldn't listen when you said, don't go in the street. Goes into the street and it's like you want to... But it's it's a combination of, why didn't you listen? And, ah, you're gone. Why didn't you... You're gone. I think that's what Jesus is feeling here. He's a God of peace. He's a God with tears. There's an instance where somebody dies and Jesus stays away when he hears that Lazarus is sick. This is a close family. When you go into Jerusalem, you have to walk up to the mountains um, and it's a hard walk. About two miles out of town, there's Bethany. It's a village and I guess, you know, if you're walking up to Jerusalem... So you want to you want to just sit down for a while. There was a family that Jesus went in to see Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha. It, Jesus loved these people. Uh, went there. Lazarus had died. Jesus walks 
from um, and walks up and comes to Bethany and we find out what happens when he sees this funeral procession. Um, look what it says. It's written on your sheet in Luke chapter 11. I'm John chapter 11. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? They asked the same question we probably would have. Well, Jesus, I'm kind of confused here. You know, because I know you're real powerful. You know, you do this healing thing all the time. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering, you know, I see you're crying for Lazarus. And, and that's commendable. I see your heart. What I don't get is, why didn't you get here sooner? And heal him. I think that's a question that people who experience war and suffering ask. Why? And we, we get a couple interesting things here. When Jesus wept, again, his weeping was not, I think it was very noticeable. It had to be because people crowding around and they were looking. And boy, boy, look at his reaction. His sobbing. You know what? That's really... That cheek... I want you to think about that cheek with me. Think of those... God. And though God and man, right? But those are tears on God's cheeks. Running down. Why? I think there's two things here. There's a compassion. He enters into the grief of these people that he loves. That's a human thing. There's something more here. It says he was troubled. That's what the text says. It says um, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Troubled is not, you know, it's not a helpless thing. If we had looked, the word is, it's what you want to do when somebody does something that's awful and you're so that it, you end up feeling such passion that it's not a, oh well, oh well, oh dear, oh my. <laughs> and what Jesus is saying, hell no! That's what it is. It's a, there's an anger here. What is he angry at? He hates death. Death wasn't his invention. Now there's some questions here, but... That's part of what is happening here. There is an anger at death and what it causes. If you doubt that, look at the next verse. It says, For he must, Jesus must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Does Jesus like death? No, it's his enemy. And he's creating a world where it will not exist. Where you won't need to you won't need implements of war. Right now, there's kingdoms in conflict and wills at war. Why are we raising these issues? We raise some difficult questions, but I just a glimpse here. What I'm showing you? A God with tears. So just think of God with tears. One who put the whole thing into place. Boy, that's interesting, isn't it? Not just tears and compassion. He's angry at what he sees. I don't understand how all it works, but that's a... Would you not, would you agree with me? Those tears? That's, that's a very interesting image. I'd like you to think about that. What do those tears communicate? On God's cheek. There was a, when I was in University of Pennsylvania, I went to 10th Presbyterian Church, and Dr. James Boyce talked for four weeks on this verse. It took him five years to get through the book of John. We spent four weeks on Jesus wept. I memorized that verse first time I was there. <laughs> What's, I don't understand what that's about. What's, um, a God with tears, not only a God with tears, a God with wounds. A God with wounds. Uh, look what it says. It's going to describe here what Jesus did with the cross. You know the way you might see a cross? If you've looked at, and we haven't dealt with specific wars, the war in Iraq, we're not gonna, what are you, I, I want you to think, though, about, you know those smart bombs? 
the ones that target something and they just hit right, and that's the weaponry, and that's one of the things about our age. We kill so many more people, the technology allows us to. But thinking of a, or a nuclear bomb, the cross of Christ is like a Scud missile. <laughs> or like a, like a bomb. And what does it blow up? Evil. Never was a weapon fashioned that so convincingly detonated in the very camp of evil and just is still now sending out shock waves. Boom! Boom! And it will eventually eliminate it. That's the way to see the cross. Not a helpless person going, oh. He, person, hell no! This will not stand! That's the way to see the cross. It's a defeating of evil. A van- that, and look what it says. That's, what, that's the sense you get in the verse. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing to the cross. Now look at this part. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. When a sinless person goes to the cross and dies, evil loses its ability to shackle people. Because the fact is, if you have sinned, you're shackled to death. Shackled to it. And it's going to drag you down. What Jesus came to do is this. Because evil has a hold on us because we've done wrong things. Anybody who sins is a slave of sin. Now, you might not have sinned as much as the person to your left or right. I might have sinned more or less than you. The fact is, all of us have sinned. Sin creates an unbreakable bond between you and death. First sin, first time, bam! It's there. You can't, you can't wrestle loose. You can't get loose. And in that way, Satan has power and authority. Even before God. Um, you know, you say that when somebody disobeys their curse, uh, he did, he did, she did, she did, he did, he, he, she, she, he, 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 she, she, she. Uh, they all did it. They are all mine. I own them. And then Jesus came. Boom! with the cross. He dies for sins, and so now, when you turn to Christ, what He does, He goes, you watching this? Click. 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 That's, that's what becoming a Christian is. It's when you lift the shackles to Jesus and say, Jesus, I've done sinful things, but I believe that You're God, and I believe that You are an unbelievable smart bomb in the camp of evil. And, and I want your death to cover my sin. And Jesus, it's like he reaches down. And, are you watching this one too? Click, click. Have your chains been taken off? You say, well, I'm not as bad as, it's not what I asked. You've sinned. I've sinned. The wages of sin is death. We're all chained. Have you acknowledged that Jesus Christ is God? Coming to earth, Why? For you. For you. To unlock you. And to bring you to be with Him forever. Why would I want to be with Him forever? It's a place that there won't be any guns. You won't find a weapon. There will not be military bases. Why haven't you given your heart to Jesus? You say, I don't understand why He allows... I know... Difficult questions. But I guess what I'm telling you, look at those are tears on his cheeks. Don't just look at his cheeks, look at his hands and his side. What are those? They're wounds. He's a God with wounds. I don't understand why God allows what he allows. But those are tears on his cheek. And those are wounds in his hand. And you know what I'm going to say to him? God, I don't get it. But I'm going to trust you. And it's not blind because I see the tears and I see the wounds. 
Will you give your life to Jesus? Say, Jesus, I want you to make me the kind of person you want me to be. He's not going to make the conflict go away. We'll talk about that this weekend. If you haven't signed up for the retreat, this is going to be an interesting one. If you're on the borders, we'll talk about how to, how to deal with God when you're in bad times. Um, I think it's going to be great stuff. Um, he's not going to take the conflict away, but he'll give you a sense of his comfort and presence in the midst of it. and means everything. Uh, ask the worship team to come up. Talked about a couple of things. Why war? There's always been war between us. There's war within us. Ultimately, the conflict starts in here. God has allowed a lot of things to happen and things that are difficult. Is He a God of war? What He tells us, He's a God of peace. We won't always accept what leads to peace. Um that he is a God with tears and a God with wounds. Can you trust him? You give your life to him, say, Jesus, I want to be the person you want me to be. Come into my life. Direct my life. Lead me. I want to be your child. Uh, We're going to sing, uh, you direct my steps, and then we'll close the service. Them with a sense of your character and guidance, give them a glimpse of yourself that can offset the fear and anxiety that are natural. And when somebody you love is is in the um, is in a in a dangerous place, um, and as we deal, as we're in the wake of a very bloody century, um, I guess it leads us to believe that maybe. Uh, we don't can't solve all our problems. It's not just technology that can solve it. There's something inside us that requires a spiritual solution. I think that's what they learned at the Shantung compound, and I ask that if there be those here who think they can defeat the evil within just by being good and nice and virtuous, I ask, would you help us to, to grasp that it requires a relationship with you? It needs a supernatural thing inside to ease the battle within us in order to ease the battle between us. And would you help us to understand that for ourselves? so that we could be more authentic followers of, of you, would you help us to have a heart like Jesus had? Trusting you in the midst of things that were really ugly, but a sense of confidence that you were with him. That's really what we need. So help us to figure that out. Live that out within us in Jesus' name. Amen. Next week we'll talk about why sickness. So make sure you're not sick next week. Just kidding.